In this next talk, we will talk about philosophy. Um, this is Peter Stuge. He has many years of experience in software, hardware, security, and networking, um, and now failure. Um, <laughs> because... <laughs> Peter is going to tell you his story with Lisp, Lip USB and about mistakes and things that he learned with that. Give him a warm welcome, please. Hello, my name is Peter. I'm a failed open source project maintainer. All right, so I will, uh, this is not a technical talk. I will talk a bit about what LibUSB is. Because of that, just mention briefly, I will mention a few things that I've seen in the LibUSB community and in related communities over the time that I've been involved. I will tell you my story, will try to tell you my story. I will talk about some mistakes that I made. And I will talk about what I learned from all of this, hopefully. So LibUSB is a, a software library for programmers that want to uh, communicate with USB devices of different kinds in an easy way. It's uh, pretty widely used in Linux systems. It's also used in some Mac OS software and um, even some Windows software here and there. If you've used a USB printer, a USB scanner, some digital camera, some media player, then it's not unlikely that you've actually been using LibUSB or the, the software that you've been using has been using LibUSB. FreeBSD has implemented LibUSB on their own for licensing reasons, as far as I understand. LibUSB is, um, is a, an LGPL library, which means that um, it's not quite as, the license is not quite as permissive as the BSD projects, and, and so they chose to uh, write their own. This is not a technical talk about device drivers, as I said. I, I gave a technical talk about USB and, and LibUSB five years ago. Um, there's the link. There's the link. Uh, check it out if you're interested in that. So while involved in, in LibUSB, I've, I've noticed or observed that even though this is a pretty, pretty widely used library and a pretty, pretty common project, there are very few people actually working on, on development here, which is a shame. I, I wish there were more. Um, there are also, there's also a, uh, there seems to be this, this tendency to not work together very much in the extended LibUSB community, I would say. There are many different LibUSB um, alternatives or sort of variants of the LibUSB concept, and they traditionally haven't done much to work together, or they've even started because of disagreements while attempting to work together or, or after trying to work together. So there's the original LibUSB 01, that's the very first one. Then there was the, the LibUSB 1.0, which is where I, uh, I was the maintainer. Meanwhile, there was the LibUSB Win32 project, which was completely standalone. It, it, it's sort of compatible with LibUSB 01. It, well, it is compatible, but it also extends LibUSB 01. It adds new features. And it's made specifically for Windows. But the developers working on LibUSB Win32, they didn't really make any effort to, to join the, the sort of the real or the original LibUSB project. They just kept to themselves and made their own thing, which caused some confusion for the users because they had to, they, all they knew were, was that, well, this. The scanner software or digital camera software or whatever it uses the USB. So I need. Why do I need to? What's the difference? Why do I need one or the other? 
And this, of course, only got worse when libusb 1.0 started working differently and started requiring programmers to do different things uh, to use the new features, uh, which libusb Win32 didn't support and never wanted to support, and development had stopped a long time ago. Then there's OpenUSB. I'll come back to that in a bit. And then there's LibUSBX. I'll come back to that in a bit, too. And uh, uh, on the side of that, there's LibUSBK. So the first uh, group of these, they're, they're sort of similar. OpenUSB is probably the most different. They decided to make their some large changes. LibUSBK is, is also different. Um, it's got its own own line simply because I don't know exactly how many developers there are. I think there's, there aren't really many. There's probably also one or two, but I don't know for sure, so I wanted to mention it separately. So moving on to, to my story, I joined the project in 2003. I just wanted to use LibUSB. I was um, um, interested in USB technology. It seemed, seemed new, or it was new, and it seemed interesting and useful. I, I was a mostly lurking subscriber. I read the mailing list. I tried to, uh, tried to answer questions when I could. I tried to contribute to the community, as, as you do, um, of course, according to what time I had and, and so on. Um, a few years later, 2005, starting winter 2005 and going all through the year of 2006, um, Sun, Sun Microsystems, anyone remember them? <laughs> all right. A few hands, okay. Um, a few of them um, joined the mailing list and, and joined the LibUSB community, and they were, they were working on what it, it seemed to be thin client USB support or, or something they wanted to have USB over the network. So they were, um, they were driving the, or, or trying to drive, they were putting a lot of effort into the project and trying to, um, trying to set a direction. But the, the maintainer at the time, Johannes Erdfeld, he didn't really agree with them, and a few other people, including myself and, and, and some others, we also didn't really agree with them. So what happened then is in, in January 2007, and I had almost forgotten about this after, after winter there, uh, the Sun people, they, they published or um, started a friendly fork called OpenUSB, that's this, this separate project. And they did it, uh, they did it in, a, in a fine way, I think. We had some, some, some at times, difficult discussions before uh, they started OpenUSB, trying to figure out how the next version of LibUSB was going to work. And they had their vision, and, and other people had another vision. They went off, and they did their thing. They got a new name, and, and they went for it. It wasn't successful, but, but you know, you never know. Um, and I think, it's, they, I think they did really the right thing. A couple of months later, the then maintainer, uh, Johannes Erdfeld, he offered me to, to take over the LibUSB project. He said he was, uh, um, he was, he had spent a lot of energy discussing with this, these OpenUSB people. And, uh, he, didn't, he didn't have fun in the project anymore, and um, he said he would be happy to let me take over, or he would be happy to, he mentioned that there might be another few people who, who could take over as well. And uh, I thought about this, and I, I was really happy to, to, um, to get this offer, but I didn't feel that I had been in the project long enough. I didn't feel that I knew the code well enough, um, even though I, I agreed with him on many points. I, I still, it, it didn't feel like I would be able to do a good job, so I, I said thank you, but, but no thank you, but I'll stay in the community and I'll try to contribute, um, continue to contribute. So then nothing happened, because Johannes, he was, he was, he was tired, and essentially there was no active maintainer in the project for, for some time until uh, January 2008 when Daniel Drake, uh, who came along, started working quite, quite a bit on, on the code. He had already done something similar for some fingerprint software that he wanted to implement, uh, or that he had implemented, and um, 
what he had, the ideas that he had for USB device communication, they fit well with the project. So he, he naturally fitted in this position of, of the new maintainer. Johannes um, announced it and everybody was happy. I was also super happy to have Daniel involved. Uh, I continued and in, in summer, later in summer, I, um, I set up a track, uh, a bug tracker and some source code hosting for, for the project. Um, Daniel continued development. So Daniel made the first LibUSB 1.0 release after he had started in, in 2008. And um, he made several releases. And uh, the, in 2010, in, in spring, he released uh, 1.0.8. So that was the last, um, the last LibUSB release that he made or released. And um, two months later, so uh, the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, there was a lot of work going on trying um, out to add Windows support to LibUSB 1.0. And uh, out of nowhere, there came this new contributor who was pretty active on the mailing list and um, very clearly he put a lot of, lot of time, a lot of effort into LibUSB. And I had, um, I had actually created ticket number one in the new bug tracker, which was to add Windows support. So, and, and I always thought that was, this was an important step for LibUSB for several different reasons, you know, get more open source software working on Windows, but also maybe trick some Windows developers into start using LibUSB and then we get the Linux support for free, right? Um, so I was, I was excited that somebody was working on, on Windows because I didn't know anything about how Windows USB worked. Really, uh, the little I knew was that it was pretty complicated. So um, anyway, this guy joined and he sent some, some diffs. He didn't send actual patches the way you would generate them with, with Git uh, normally and send them to a mailing list, but he sent, sent diffs without any commit message and, and not so structured. And I gave him a lot of feedback um, about these and I was, I was um, expecting that he would send another round of patches as, as normally happens in open source projects with uh, at least some of these, these things addressed, where he'd, he'd sort of thought about what I, the feedback I had given, and um, uh, no, that didn't really happen. So there were, there were new patches, but not much of the feedback had been um, considered. So this continued through the beginning of 2010, and one of the last things that Daniel did before he, um, he moved on was to commit some, some of the Windows support into LibUSB 1.0. Now, I, I wasn't, I, I thought that was too early. I didn't think this code was, was quite, quite there yet, um, but Daniel had, had done it, and I didn't really want to um, object, or I didn't want to revert the source code, undo what he had done. I thought that was a bit respect, um, showing not so much respect for, for the previous maintainer. So I, sort of the solution that I saw was, okay, let's, let's fix this up and let's get the next release out because it's, it's high time. It's nice to have releases every now and then, but I also felt that it was important not to add too many new bugs or leave too many bugs or like if we release something, we're, Windows support for the very first time, at least it should work. And uh, that, took, that took a long time. Um, the development in this, this time, it wasn't, I wasn't working so well together with this, uh, this guy who joined, who did uh, much of the Windows work. Uh, endless email threads on the mailing list. And during this time, a lot of people, they just abandoned the project because they couldn't keep up with the volume of email, and I, I found it hard too. I don't know what, what the other guy, how, how he felt about it, but um, he kept doing it anyway, and I, um, I, I was still happy that there was a Windows developer, but I also felt it, that it was very difficult. I, I, I really felt how difficult it was to work together. I kept pushing forward. I'm, I can be pretty stubborn sometimes, so I, I kept pushing forward and, and just trying to work on the code and trying to get the, the 
um, the window support into shape and uh, finally made a release candidate, the first one in, in 2011. And then later, um, a few months later, there was uh, one person on the mailing list, somebody else, who, uh, who, who said or who wrote this, um, fundamental, incomprehensible, and it seems unresolvable disparity between what you see as reasonable and the right way to conduct development and what the rest of us feel. This was just one of these kinds of emails. There were lots of them. And of course, this didn't help my motivation very much, but uh, not even not help my motivation. It was hard. It was hard to hear this. But I, I kept going because I, I felt that we should get this Windows support done and, and released. A few months later still, April 19th, 2012, there was an email thread started on the LibUSB mailing list announcing a hostile fork with the subject, LibUSB is dead, long live U, uh, LibUSB X. Um, and uh, yes, to celebrate, so this is the, the Windows guy who was also um, driving the LibUSB X uh, initiation or, or, yes, fork. <coughs> He, um, he said yes, or wrote, to celebrate the two-year anniversary of the last public release of LibUSB, which is the 108 that Daniel made about half a year before he made me maintainer. Um, they announced LibUSB X, and they think this two-year anniversary is proof enough that LibUSB is a dead project. So they. He's, he's, he's an excellent rhetoric, this person. He's very, very good at writing English. He's, he's an Irish, Irishman. Mm, and if you look in the LibUSB X, so they started their own mailing list at, on SourceForge, and if you look through the archives, you can see that they worked quite a lot on this text before they pulled, um, sent it out to the, to the mailing list. They, um, they had multiple iterations going through, and they really, if you compare the versions, you can see how they really tweaked words and sentences here and there to create a very specific uh, effect or to send a very specific message. It was very well engineered uh, propaganda. They're saying that LibUSB is a dead project in there, in there. Uh, fork announcement, even though we've been working on it constantly for two years. So there are lots of commits in, in, the, in the repository, public commits for anyone to see. There wasn't a release. A um, lot of users, they said, we want a release, we want a release, we want a release, and I wanted a release too, but like I said, I didn't really want to release just anything. I wanted the, this Windows support to, to be all right, and, and not to have too many problems. It needed to, to, to work all right. And I also wanted to fix as many bugs as possible in the, in the previous version. Um, yeah. They also mentioned here, if you're interested in submitting patches to, to the LibUSB X fork, uh, please be aware that LibUSB X will soon have Garrett and Jenkins operational. So this was in uh, 2012. There's, there never was any Garrett or, or Jenkins for LibUSB X, by the way. But oh well. Anyway, so on April the 20th, um, some 20 hours code sprinting later, I, I put out the 109 release. And um, it included some 200, 260 commits since the previous version. So there was quite a lot of work that went into, in, went into this, this 109 release over these two years since the last one. I think I spent about 2,000 hours, roughly, uh, over two years. So that's about a half-time half -time job, 20 hours a week on this project. But it wasn't enough, and it wasn't, I didn't do it, I didn't spend it on exactly the right things. Um, there was this, this uh, people pushing for a release, and, and I didn't deliver on the release, and I'll get back to that. So in, in May, just a, a few weeks later, Red Hat um, employee who was also involved in LibUSBX, he, he had a blog, which he was posting in, and uh, 
he hadn't posted about libusb x or libusb before, but he, he posted this um, very short blog post, just two, two lines of text or one and a half line of text about how he had now switched the package for providing the libusb functionality in Fedora over to use the fork, libusbx. And it took maybe a week, maybe even, maybe even less, just a few days, for all the major distributions to, uh, to follow. They had suddenly also, all of them, switched to using libusbx. And um, not a single one got in touch with me to, to sort of ask, OK, what's, what's going on? I, I, I guess nobody looked in the repository and saw that all the commits were, uh, or not all the commits, but that many commits were also by or involving me, uh, the existing maintainer of the project, I'm, I'm, yes, I don't know. I guess it was enough that Fedora switched. I got to uh, try to get in touch with some of them. I sent uh, the Arc Linux maintainers uh, an email with some, uh, a per direct email, no mailing list, um, telling them how I felt about this situation and, and how it really broke my heart that nobody actually got in touch with me and or like, as it seemed to me, bothered to look into some facts about this, this whole situation. And um, by accident, I later learned that, um, or I, I got a link, and this email was up on Pastebin. So thanks for that. I, I don't know. I found that strange. Oh, well. Anyway, so there was this fork, and there was uh, still the original project and we were working alongside. Um, most of the people, they went to the fork because they saw there, uh, there was a potential for new and exciting things. But the one guy who, uh, who had always been working on the Mac OS uh, support, he was sticking with the original project. And he was also very outspoken against this, this hostile fork. He said he disagreed very strongly with, with some of the technical decisions they made and, and also how, how they had conducted themselves. And, and I was super happy to have his support. Hmm. No bugs. All right, let's see. There we go. All right, so a little bit later, or sometime later, I don't know exactly because my network connection dropped out when I was, was trying to research this, uh, Nathan unexpectedly removes me from the libusb project on SourceForge. So this was the, the primary distribution point for, for the project, and it was where the mailing list was and, and where we published releases. Okay, so he suddenly decides to take over the project take control over the project. He was working on some, some changes, and I, again, I, I felt very strongly that they weren't ready. There were some issues with them. I communicated the issues to him, and he didn't, uh, I'm not sure that he understood exactly what the issues were, and I'm sure that he was frustrated that the development wasn't moving forward. I really am. Still, so the next thing he did was he invited all of the libusbx people to join the project. And, and I, those two things, they really, really surprised me. I, I didn't expect that. I did not see that coming. Um, and so they then sort of say that they are libusb uh, in 2014. The libusb code, libusbx, sorry, code base, that they, they continue working on, on their code, and I continue working on my code. And there's this commit in the GitHub libusb repository, which is, shows pretty clearly that um, what they call merging is really just renaming their, their um, libusbx code base to libusb. And no, not many people knew that. I spoke with a pretty prominent Linux kernel developer. He didn't notice this either. I, or, I mean, he just read, reads the news like everyone else, right? And in the news, it says the project's merged. So mistakes that I made. I made a lot of mistakes. Few of them were more important 
than the other ones. The major mistake I made, which would have avoided all these problems, was uh, to not release anything, because that is what, what sort of signals activity in the project to anyone who is not working on the project. You could, you could say that it's only for show, and actually if you do a release and there's nothing really much that has changed, then that's perfectly fine, as long as you sort of send out a heartbeat and, and make sure that people know that, well, the project is still moving forward, even if there's nothing really happening. Another mistake I made was that I was, I'm, I'm, I'm Swedish, and I think it's a trait in Scandinavia that we, we like to seek consensus, and I did that far, for far too long. I was trying very, very hard to work together with other developers who wanted to do different things than I wanted to do, and who wanted to do things differently than I wanted to do, and I shouldn't have um, I shouldn't have tried to do that for so long. I should have much, much quicker. At some point, I finally realized, okay, this is not going to work out. We should go separate ways. But that took me like a good year and a half of fighting, as this kernel developer called it, uh, as, or discussing, as, as I had the impression that we were doing. Um, but that wasn't how it was perceived the outside. The outside, they had uh, a lot of negative negativity come out of these pretty intense discussions. And there's a really good uh, presentation by Donny Burkholz, where he, among other things, says that um, five, um, one negative experience requires five positive experiences within an open source project or um, any voluntary project for a contributor to stay stay there and to stay to sort of level things out. So for every single negative thing, there are five good that are needed. That's a lot of, a lot of positive stuff that is needed to compensate for just a single bad experience. I learned lots of things about how different contributors do um, well, what motivates different contributors and, and what kind of, that there are different kinds of contributors. I was, I was quite naive when I started uh, maintaining this project and um, I, was, I was engaged in the project for, for selfless reasons. I wanted to make a, a good software library for others to use, for others to benefit from and, and for me myself to use as well. But that's not necessarily what drives everyone else, right? Especially if you have corporate contributors. So the Red Hat guy, for example, he just needed to solve the problem that the paying customer had. Um, and he didn't really care much about the, the drama. He just needed a working library, right? Package maintainers in operating system distributions, I learned that they don't... Um, Maybe don't look so much into the facts. They, I tried to talk with several of them. They were all super, super busy and stressed and um, overworked. And of course, they don't have time to, to do investigative journalism. I learned about trolls on the internet. I'm not saying that people were, were trolls, but I was trolled. Um, and I let myself be trolled, and I fed the trolls. And that's, that's not good, because it creates these negative experiences within the project, and that hurts the community, and it hurts, it hurts me as well. GitHub, that's a funny story, but we're a bit out of time. I'll skip that and go right to what I learned about myself. Um, I want, to do, I want to do things really, really well, and I learned that I, besides the consensus thing, that I try to do that too much, I learned that I try to do things too well. Um, I, have to, I have to work on that. I have to be, um, I have to be more open to uh, how other people want to do things, and I have to also not insist that we fix all the problems before we've experienced them. I have to uh, let things go wrong sometimes, and, and maybe I can, in, in, in retrospect, then say, I told you so. 
Thank you. Thank you very much.